useful debate, which is to talk about the first stage to what I think is the most important election, certainly in my lifetime. And to introduce this, let's reflect on a fact that I think most of us have recognized, which is this is a scary time. Uh, whether it's scary politicians in Britain or in Germany, um, or politicians in the United States who scare people, many people are scared by the options that we face. But none of those scare me. What scares me is the growing skepticism across the world with the very institution of democracy. In a number of contexts, I've found myself surrounded by people who've said things like, what's wrong with the, uh, quote, people? How could they be so stupid? What scares me is this elite sneer at this populist moment. And that scares me because it reflects an obtuseness, an obliviousness, which misses a critical truth about why we are here, and thus the urgent need to do something to fix it. This debate next Monday is, I think, a metaphor for this more fundamental struggle. Those watching the debate will be divided into two groups, and we will hear first how the elites see it, then how the rest of us will see it. And for the elites, people who take the system as we have it for granted, this will be a fight about ideas. And I think there's little doubt that in that fight about ideas, Clinton will win that fight. But for most people, not the elite, for whom nothing is taken for granted, this will be a fight about the system of our government. The issues won't matter. What will matter is who can make change, who will make change happen. And on this, I fear Clinton is in trouble. New York Times had a survey they published last Thursday, really an astonishing collection of results about the attitudes of ordinary Americans. And what it shows is that most Americans think Clinton is the safer choice for president. On the major issues, she outdoes Donald Trump on everyone except the economy, terrorism and national security, immigration, foreign policy. A significant majority believe she has the right kind of temperament to be a good president. Less than a third believe Donald Trump does. More people believe she shares their values than Donald Trump does. But when the question is asked, who could bring about real change the way things are done in Washington, it's Donald Trump who outdoes Hillary Clinton by a significant majority. And the truth is, is if she can't crack this deficit, she loses. She certainly loses the debate. And I think possibly the election. Okay, so when I ran for the objective of being a candidate in the Democratic primary, a friend wrote a piece in Bloomberg View relating my campaign to Frank Capra's Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. Cass Sunstein's a dear friend, and I was moved by his piece, which tried to elevate the idea of this campaign to something that might inspire people. And you might recognize Mr. Smith goes to Washington. Here's this man appointed to the Senate, the Senate which represents the core of America's political establishment. And Mr. Smith was an anti-establishment uh, senator. All the things that we want to believe we are, he was. Honest, courageous, and committed. Essentially the opposite of what we understand Washington to be. And people would rally to Mr. Smith because he was not DC. And they would rally despite his particular weaknesses. 
like for example, his choice of ties or his inability to comb his hair. These things didn't matter to people because what did matter was the idea that he was standing up to the establishment, standing for values which were deeply American. Now what's hard for us in the elite to recognize is that in this election, Donald Trump is Mr. Smith. Donald Trump is not Washington. That is how he's perceived. He is not PC, he is not triangulating, he is not beholden. That is how he is perceived. He is seen to be stating simple truths. And the contrast between him and Hillary Clinton in this respect could not be greater. So think, for example, about this extraordinary incident that just happened recently. This video, the New York Times posts, capturing this really human but tragic moment where she is uh, collapsing because of the condition she has. And then they immediately cut to Hillary Clinton after. How do you feel except they're great. What happened? Give us a second, give us a little statement. It's a beautiful day in New York. Madam Secretary, how are you feeling? Great. It's a beautiful day in New York. Madam Secretary, how are you feeling? Great. We're feeling great. What happened? What happened? Okay, so here we've just seen her collapse. And she's asked a very simple question. How are you doing? Just great. And then she's asked, well, what happened? And the answer is, it's a beautiful day in New York. <laughs> and I think in this single instance, we can see something of what she is up against. Because this simple human moment, any of us can get sick. <laughs> any of us, especially if you're running for president for essentially the last three years, can get sick. This simple human moment, begging for her to speak a simple truth. I was sick. It's really hard. I have pneumonia. Gets lost. And in this single scene, what the Times was doing by putting these two images together of her being sick and yet living in this world of denial confirms the way she is being framed as just of a piece with the way Washington is. It confirms the image, which I don't think is fair or true, but the image the world has of her as posturing and inauthentic and unreal. And in an age of reality TV, that is the quickest way to get voted off the island. Now, don't get me wrong here, right? This should be obvious, I hope. I am not pro-Trump, I am trapped by certain attitudes I have. People talk about PC, all I see is C, which I understand to be correct, right? <laughs> so I hear people talk about the simple truths Donald Trump is uttering, and I think they are simple. Simple. Too simple. So simple as to be stupid truths sometimes, or maybe rarely truths, or truth doesn't seem to have much to do with it. So I'm not saying these things I'm saying about Donald Trump to say, I personally believe this man should be president. I am saying it should be possible for us to understand with empathy what's going on here, because what's going on here is a significant portion of our public believes this man should be president. And what we should understand when we look at that public with empathy and understanding and respect is that they see Trump not as a trigger for something, but as a trigger against something, against Washington, against a status quo, a status quo that many of them believe is corrupted and unresponsive, an elite-driven democracy, or a, quote, democracy, because it's not responsive to ordinary Americans. And the best evidence of that motivation comes from the New Hampshire primary. In New Hampshire, they have the option for primary voters to be undeclared, which means they don't affiliate with either party until the day of the primary. And on the day of the primary, they come in and they declare either for the Republicans or the Democrats. 
38% of voters in New Hampshire are undeclared. But the polling for this last primary was incredibly puzzling because the toughest choice those undeclared voters had was to choose between voting for Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders. Now think of the mind of somebody who can't decide between Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders. What is it that's making that choice hard for them? Were they uncertain because they were confused? No. I think instead it's the elite who is confused. They are confused, the elite, about the power of the frustration that's at the core of how politics is right now, the frustration that people on the left and right have with the way this government has been corrupted and the distance they feel between them and what their government stands for. Okay, so is it real, this anger? Is it justified? And my view is absolutely is it justified. In this sense, at least, I want to say absolutely I am a populist. I'm not a populist in every respect. Look, I make the elite for a living. I'm a Harvard law professor. But in this respect, I am a populist. This system is unspeakably corrupt. But how it is corrupt is not clear because the corruption of this system does not mean we have criminals in our government. It's not bribery that I'm talking about. What it means is a corrupted system. One might say, same as it ever was, but it is a system of corruption. So to begin this, I want to understand what this corruption is or understand how it exists. And I want to understand it through some examples, namely three. Here's the first. If we started from this beautiful place in Dayton and we traveled 1,500 miles southwest to El Paso. And then we climbed in a time machine and we went back about 100 years to old El Paso and wandered downtown. We would be lucky if we met this man, Lawrence Nixon. Nixon was a doctor. He moved to El Paso in 1910. And every two years between 1910 and 1924, uh, 1922, he walked down to his polling place, paid his polling tax, and he voted. But in 1924, when he walked to his polling place, he was told, you know you can't vote. And in response, he said, I know you can't let me vote, but I've got to try. And the reason in 1924 he could not vote is that Texas in 1923 had adopted a law. And the law said that for the Democratic primary, only whites could vote. An all-white primary where only whites were invited to participate, meaning that in the first stage of this two-stage process for selecting the candidates who would represent Texas, blacks were excluded. Step one, whites voted. Step two, all could vote. To run in that general election, you had to do well in that white primary. This two-stage process that would filter the candidates because 16% of the population had been excluded in that critical first step with the consequence, right, this is obvious, of producing a democracy that was responsive to whites only. Okay, that dynamic, that trick, that democracy-defeating device is not uncommon. Here's the second example. If we climbed in an airplane here in Dayton and traveled 8,500 miles, we would find ourselves in Hong Kong. About a year and a half ago, you might remember, Hong Kong was in the middle of extraordinary <laughs> protests. The protest Hong Kong found itself swept into was because of a law. The law was a law designed to craft the process for electing the chief executive, the governor of Hong Kong. The aspect of this law said the ultimate aim is the selection of a chief executive by universal suffrage upon nomination by a broadly representative nominating committee in accordance with democratic procedures. Nomination by a nominating committee. Committee. Okay, that committee was going to have 1,200 people. 
which means out of a population of 7 million is about 0.02%. 0.02% nominate who gets to run. Now that's a tiny number, as you can see on the screen, very, very small number, right? If you thought about it in relation to everybody else in Hong Kong, it would look something like this. This is what 0.02% looks like. This tiny fraction, the committee that selects the candidate that then the rest of Hong Kong gets to vote among. So to run in that general election, you had to do really well in the nominating committee, a two-stage process, which the protesters said would be biased by this filter in the middle because the 0.02% would be dominated by a pro-Beijing business and political elite. It's not an all-white primary. It was an all-red primary. And the consequence of this, they thought, obviously, was to produce a democracy that would be responsive to China, only. Okay, those two examples are obvious in some sense. Nobody would argue those are producing democracies in the sense that we believe a democracy should allow representative selection of candidates and elected representatives. So why isn't this one obvious too? We take it for granted in America that campaigns will be privately funded. But we should recognize that funding is its own contest. Funding is its own primary. It takes time to raise the money you need to run a campaign. Estimates by scholars say it's between 30 and 70% of the time for members of Congress and candidates for Congress dialing for dollars. This is, this is a telephone for any of you millennials here. Um, <laughs> dialing for dollars, calling people all around the country to raise the money that they need to fund their campaigns or to help to get their party back into power. B.S. Skinner gave us this image of the Skinner box where any stupid animal could learn which buttons it needed to push to get the sustenance it needed to survive. This is a picture of the life of an ordinary member of Congress right now. As an ordinary member of Congress learns through this process which buttons he or she must push to get the sustenance his or her campaign needs to survive. This life has an effect on them. They develop a sixth sense, a constant awareness about how what they do will affect their ability to raise money come in the words of the X-Files, shape shifters, as they constantly adjust their views in light of what they know will help them to raise money. Not necessarily on issues 1 to 10, but certainly on issues 11 to 1,000. Leslie Byrne, a Democrat from Virginia, describes that when she went to Congress, she was told by a colleague, quote, always lean to the green. And to clarify, she went on, you know, he was not an environmentalist. <laughs> so this is a primary. We could call it the money primary, not the white primary, but a green primary, right? It's the first stage, this greenback primary in a two-stage process for selecting the candidates who get to run. So to be able to run in the regular elections where people vote for you, you've got to do really well in this greenback primary. So this structure you've seen before. It's what Hong Kong protested against. It's what the white primary was replicating. It raises the question, who are these funders? Well, we could think first about the biggest funders, the people who give the most money. And there are people who give an extraordinary amount of money in this process. In 2014, the top 100 gave as much as the bottom 4.75 million combined. In the early stage of this presidential election, a tiny, tiny fraction, 134 gave as much as half of the total money that was combined. And the same with the super PACs, 50 people have given half the money that has gone to the super PAC. Those are the biggest funders. But I don't think it's interesting to look just at the biggest funders. I think we should think about the relevant funders of campaigns for Congress. The people members are thinking about as they dial for dollars the people whose contribution is significant enough to matter so that on the printout sheet it says, executive at Exxon, here's the issue she cares about. These people who give enough to matter are the funders I think of as the relevant funders in this first stage of this campaign. So what is that number? How much do you have to be give to be a relevant funder? Well, in 2014, the maximum amount you could give is $5,200. Let's take that as the relevant funder. In any one campaign, the most you could give was $5,200. If you went to Washington and you said, 
a relevant funder gives $5,200, they'd laugh at you. They think you need to give much more than that. But I'm being conservative. Let's say $5,200 represents the amount you need to give to qualify as one of these relevant funders. It turns out in 2014, there were 57,874 Americans who gave $5,200 or more. And for the math majors in the room, what you're recognizing when I tell you 57,874 Americans is that that's about 0.02% of America dominating this first stage of this two-stage process to elect candidates to Congress. 0.02%. You wonder where the Chinese got their idea? It was here. They got their idea. This tiny fraction of the 1%, this Chinese fraction of the 1% dominating this first stage in this two-stage election process with the consequence, obviously, of producing a democracy responsive to the funders only. So Princeton's study, which is a Harvard professor I don't like to talk about, so I'll put it off the stage really quickly here, by Martin Gillens and Ben Page, the largest empirical study of actual policy decisions by our government in the history of political science, gathering the attitudes of Americans about these policy decisions and relating them to what our government actually did. And what they found was if you took the attitudes of the economic elite and related it to what our government actually did, the relationship is what you would predict. The higher the percentage of the elite who supported a policy change, the more likely it was that the policy change actually happened. So it goes from 10%, almost 0% chance that it actually happens, to if 90% support the policy change, a 35% chance that it actually happens. That's the way a democracy is supposed to work. The more who support something, the more likely it is that will happen. They did the same with interest groups in a similar graph. The larger the number of interest groups who support something, the more likely it is that it would happen. Okay, here's the graph for the average citizen's preferences. It's a flat line, literally and figuratively. What this is saying is it doesn't matter the percentage of average citizens who support something. It doesn't change the probability of it having been enacted, as they described it in English. When the preferences of the economic elites and the stands of organized interest groups are controlled for, the preferences of the average American appear to have only a minuscule, near zero, statistically non-significant impact on public policy in a democracy. The average citizen's views are not mattering, right? Here's the picture we were told that described our democracy. There we are, we the citizens, driving the bus. Here is the reality of how this democracy has evolved. It's not us driving the bus because the steering wheel has come disconnected from the bus. We no longer steer the bus because we've allowed this structure of corruption to break the connection between what ordinary Americans believe and what our government actually does. So should America be angry at this? My view is yes. You know, to remix a little bit of Obama, yes, we are here, or at least, yes, we should be here. This is our democracy that has been stolen. The people need to embrace some Hamilton here and rise up and take our shot at getting this democracy back. Now, the point is, in all three of these examples, what I've given you here is a dynamic that corrupts the very process of democracy. And the dynamic is the same. And we can give it a name, inspired by maybe the greatest political philosopher of 19th century America, Tweedism, named after Boss Tweed, who was Tammany's Hall, the boss of Tammany Hall in the 19th century. Boss Tweed famously used to say, quote, I don't care who does the electing as long as I get to do the nominating, right? So this image <laughs> of this genius insight about how you control a democracy is what we have allowed to evolve in our democracy. What Tweed understood is that if he controlled the nominating, if the people knew that they needed Tweed's support to get nominated, it didn't matter what happened after that. Tweed controlled those candidates. And what we've allowed to happen is the development of a system where the Tweeds are now the funders of campaigns. And what the candidates know is they have to keep those Tweeds happy. 
tweedism is any multiple stage process where the tweeds have this unrepresentative influence at the first stage of this process with the consequence, obviously, of producing the system responsive to the tweeds only. Tweedism, there's the definition. An unrepresentative process, formal or informal, for selecting candidates to be representatives. That's the essence of the corruption we've allowed American government to embrace. Okay. Now, the sad thing about this election cycle is that there was a chance that in this election cycle we could fix this. If you think back to about December a year ago, people could be hopeful that this election cycle would actually fix this. Remember, in the first presidential debate in the Republican primary, Donald Trump stood out and called out every one of those candidates on stage except for the non-politicians and said, I own all of you. I've contributed to all of you. All of you are dependent on people like me. We can't trust you because you're going to be thinking about your funders and not the interests of the public. And for the first time in 50 years, a Republican was talking about the corrupting influence of money inside of the political system. And Republicans who recognized that corruption, the grassroots Republicans, responded to that by understanding him as an outsider who could change the system. But it wasn't just Trump. Both Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders had explicitly, for the first time Democrats had done it in 50 years, endorsed the idea of public funding for congressional elections. That was in the platform of both of them. So it seemed all the major forces in this presidential election primary season were rallying around the idea that this was a problem to solve. But today... The idea that this is the problem that would be solved is kind of hopeless. Donald Trump was anti-super PAC until he met Sheldon Adelson and then became pro-super PAC and supports his super PAC and encourages super PAC contributions. Bernie Sanders did an extraordinary job focusing America's attention on the corrupting influence of money in politics, but he only did it to use that argument to attack Hillary Clinton not to educate us about what we could actually do to solve the problem. And her response to his attack should have been to say, hey, Bernie, come on, you and I both know it's the Congress that's the problem here. It's the corrupt Congress that's the problem here. And give me a Democratic Congress, and I guarantee I will fix it. That's what she should have said. But instead, what she said was, show me the quid pro quo. Show me the thing that I did, that I did because of the money. Show me how I've been corrupted, which is the Alicia Silverstone version of Hillary Clinton, the clueless about what the problem here is, because the problem is not the quid pro quo. The problem is a system that drives our political representatives to focus not on representing, but on supporting the funding they need for their campaigns. So here is where we are now at this election cycle. Republicans won't say money corrupts politics. Democrats aren't allowed to say money corrupts politics. But the public believes money corrupts politics, that this system is corrupt. So what that means is that this issue has gone from being an issue we explicitly discuss to an issue that's just implicit in the background of this election. But she, Hillary Clinton, is framed as corrupt in this story, and he is framed as an outsider. And in this context, in this political moment, the outsider has the advantage. And that raises the big central challenge that she faces as we go into this 2016 debate. The one question that I think will define this debate is, can she escape the frame that's been placed around her? Unfairly, in my view, for however much she has profited from this system, I know in her heart of hearts, she hates the influence of this system. She wants a Congress that could actually do the right thing. But that is the frame she lives within right now. But the people want change, 
And the question is, can she change? Can she credibly promise change? Can she promise to become her opposite? Can she make people believe she will become the opposite of who they think she is? Now that sounds impossibly hard until you recognize others have done this in our political history. When you think about Lyndon Baines Johnson, from our perspective, Lyndon Baines Johnson is to be loved. He's loved by civil rights leaders circa 2016. But we forget, in 1959, he was hated by civil rights leaders. African Americans said they would boycott the election if he were the nominee because everybody viewed him as the product of a southern racial system and imagined him as president just continuing the racism of the past. But what Johnson did was recognize that the only way he would succeed was be to embrace his weakness and make it his strength. And so when he was thrust into the presidency, the first commitment he made was a commitment to pass civil rights legislation that all of his advisors believed was impossible to pass. And when he had that extraordinary meeting, that first evening to discuss his priorities, and he was told it was impossible to pass and that he should not do it because if he failed, it would define his whole administration. Johnson turned to his advisors and said, what the hell is being president for? And he embraced and grabbed the courage necessary to redefine himself. And we now think of him as a great liberator in the process of this civil rights revolution, which of course he was late to, but was essential to making successful. Or think about Richard Nixon, rabid anti-communist, until he went to China and met Mao Zedong and then became the great peacemaker with the communists. He embraced his weakness and turned it into his strength. The question this debate will raise is, can she? Can she make her weakness her strength? Can she credibly say, yes, I know this system is corrupt. I know it because I've lived it. But it can't go on, this corruption. Can she say, give me a Democratic Congress and I promise in the first 100 days we will fix it? Can she say that powerfully and credibly enough the way Johnson grabbed civil rights and Nixon grabbed peace with the communists and make it believable? No one knows whether she can, but I'm 100% certain that she must if this election is not to be the extraordinary tragedy that it seems to be playing out to be. So let me end with one word about you. The most frustrating thing of this election for me is not actually the candidates. Second to the frustration I see people have with democracy, it's a frustration with you. And by you, I mean the millennials in this room. The idealistic millennials in this room, the idealism which in every moment of my life I celebrate and encourage that makes you think you will not accept second best, makes you say I want the very best. And what frustrates me is that that idealism is now confused in this election. New York Times recent poll showed that the most significant deficit in the voting for this election cycle comes from the millennials who are either deciding not to vote or deciding to vote for third party candidates who are speaking as if they are insulted by the idea that they don't get to get their first choice and that if they don't get their first choice, they're going to take their ball and go home. But here's the fact of democracy. Democracy is the enterprise of learning to live with people who are different from you. And if it turns out that a majority of those different from you have produced candidates that aren't your first choice, the obligation of citizenship is to exercise your choice in a way that is the most responsible you can do it. 
and walking away from this election is not responsible. Voting for candidates who cannot win expresses yourself like an artistic expression. It makes you feel good, I get it. But if the consequence is a result which you all would hate, it's not responsible. There are 100,000 beautiful souls in Florida who cast their votes for Ralph Nader in 2000. They felt good as they left the polling place. They felt they had done what they came to do. They expressed themselves. 100,000 voters. And then George Bush won the state by 547 votes. If just 10% had said to themselves, you know, there's more at stake than my artistic expression, the first 10 years of this century would have been radically different. This first debate is important, not just because it's the moment for Hillary Clinton to escape the frame that traps her, but it's the moment for you to become resolved to the choice that your democracy has given you and to stand up as a citizen and exercise that choice responsibly in a way that you know will advance what you want the world to become, not what you wish the world had been. I'm someone who lives every moment with the wish for a world that could have been radically different than how it turned out to be. I know the disappointment and the frustration and the anger and the view of injustice that so motivates this frustration among many. It's not an excuse. We are citizens in a democracy at a crucial moment in the history of this democracy. And whether you're for Trump or whether you're for Clinton or whether you're for Sanders or whether you're for anyone else, the thing to think is you have a responsibility as a citizen. And I fling myself from Iceland to come see you tonight to speak to you mainly, because I beg you to exercise that responsibility with intelligence and integrity. Thank you very much. So I'm eager, happy to take questions, or after that little sermon, some abuse, if that's appropriate, you tell me. But um, um, I don't know if you just, so it looks like there's not mics, but if you, oh, there are mics. So if you want to take to the mics, that would be great. It isn't. I have a question that relates to the frame that you talked about. And I, I want you to think back about when Jimmy Carter ran for your election against Ryan Reagan. The Carter campaign whole stick was he's an unreliable person, he's not fit to be president. All Reagan needed to do was show up and play the role of president in the debate as well. Is Hillary in a similar danger, having tried to frame uh, Trump to the point where if he shows up and plays president, that that strategy is backfiring? Yeah, I think this is his, her, her biggest da danger. That all that she, all that Trump needs to do, is to seem like a sensible person on that stage. Nobody's going to care about the policy he utters. The bar is so low that if he just doesn't punch Hillary Clinton, the press will rally to this amazing thing he's done of demonstrating he's presidential. And then we're back to the original frame, which is a frustrated public that wants to see change, just like 1980, a frustrated public that wanted to be say, that, that picked Ronald Reagan. Let me ask a follow-up question. Do you think Trump will do that? Yeah, I do. I do. I mean, he's not going to be, he, he, I don't think he has the capacity to you know, be a, a subtle, informed policy debater. But I do think he understands what he needs to do is just to show he is a sane, responsible leader. And if he shows that, then he's won. 
and all it, I mean, he's won what he needs to win. And then it's up to Hillary to demonstrate that she is not just a continuation of the status quo of Washington, that she is more than that. And I genuinely believe she wants to be more than that. Whether she has the courage to embrace something more is a different question. Over here. Great. Hi. So, if I like the presentation you have for Clinton is very motivating to me, and if I think what you're saying were true, I would vote for her in a second. But I just don't believe that she is going to have the courage to make the changes to get there. And I can't support Trump either for the things that he said. So I'm going to vote for a third party candidate. And though I know that it doesn't seem likely that a third party candidate will win. I think that if during this election a third party candidate gets 10 to say 15 percent of the vote, that the next election cycle we won't be looking at this bionic two party system. We'll be looking at a system in which people actually believe that there's a chance for somebody who isn't represented by one of these parties to make the presidency. So uh, my I think question is: Is it worth it to vote for a third party candidate to say? It doesn't look like we're going to win this round, but let's cut our losses. Let's protest and let's change things. Okay, so I support the motivation you have to break the duopoly of Republican Democratic politics. I completely support that. That is a good motivation because the only way we're going to begin to get a politics that reflects the diversity of America is to diversify our politics. So I'm with you with that 100%. The argument is about what's the most effective way to bring that about. So you have a theory. The theory is if Gary Johnson gets 10%, then the next election cycle, the independents can do much better. I don't think that theory is true. I mean, we've seen stuff like this before. Ross Perot you know, stepped in, and he basically elected Bill Clinton by the way in which he interfered with that, what he had an effect on that election. But it's not like after Ross Perot, we had another independent who came and got more than Ross Perot. These are episodic blips against the background of a corrupt duopoly, which will not allow people to step in. I think it's absolutely unjust, the way the system is set up. And I want to fight the system, but you fight the system, by forcing changes in the way the rules of the system are written, by you know, supporting ballot petitions that open up the process to third parties, by doing all the things, the hard work that's necessary to change the system. Voting for Gary Johnson or Jill Stein is not hard. It's easy. And what I'm trying to suggest is the argument you gave for not voting for Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton um, you know, could be reframed as they're both in some sense evil. And I don't want to vote for the lesser of two evils. But if the consequence of not voting for the lesser of the two evils is to get the greater evil, how is that responsible? How is that possibly a sensible thing to do? Why isn't that just cutting off your nose to spite your face? If you don't like the two of them, but you like one of them much less than the other, or you hate one much more than the other, I don't understand the refusal to make the choice that you've been presented with, the realistic choice. Um, even though I completely embrace and will support and march with you in favor of the idea of breaking the stupid duopoly that sinks the American political system right now. Those are two separate points. And all I'm suggesting is here in Ohio, which could easily become the Florida of this election cycle, what has to happen in Ohio is people have to separate their frustration with an unjust system from a real choice they face tomorrow, which is who's going to be the president? And a person who gets to pick the Supreme Court? Now, you might be a conservative. You might want to conserve the Supreme Court. I get that. But if you, you know, believe that it's important a woman has a right to choose or that you believe that it's important that, um, uh, that sexual orientation does not block access to basic things in American society. I, I know that's a contested view, but I'm saying if that is your view, then you have to recognize Donald Trump will change those realities. It will just be different. Um, now, again, some people say that's a good reason to support him. I'm not arguing with that person. I'm arguing with the person who thinks those are values in our Constitution we should protect. Those at least will change. And that, it seems to me, putting aside the other issues, like you know, a person who you know, the differences between the attitudes and the temperament 
which, ter- which frankly are the things that terrify me the most, those are reasons to evaluate, not whether one is good and one is bad, but which is actually closer to bringing about the world that you want. We, reformers, have not convinced enough of our fellow citizens to join with us. Um, We who supported Bernie Sanders did not get enough of our fellow Democrats to support him. We failed. Okay, we failed. And the consequence of us failing is we don't get to choose our first choice. But the responsibility of us having failed is to at least pick our second choice because the third or fourth or fifth choices are radically worse from the perspective of what we want. Yes, sir. Hello. I would like to make people around the personal. Uh, second of all, so when you use the examples of Johnson and Nixon and how they changed their image, however, they changed their image after they ran for presidency. So if you use the case of Hillary Clinton and you said how she can change her from the way she's portrayed and how people have forgotten, how did she then say, oh, I'm going to fix, fix the way Washington is set up and change the system? How did she say that? Yeah, I completely agree with you that it is a hard sell for Hillary Clinton. And I'm even sold the best. I, I don't think it gets more than 30 or 40 percent of the skeptics. But getting 30 or 40 percent of the skeptics would be a huge uh, gain for her. Um, and it would give a lot of us who are disappointed at what happened in the primary process a reason to go out and fight. If she said, give me a Democratic Congress and and I will pass these laws, then we have a reason to go out and fight, not just for Hillary Clinton, but also for members of Congress who we know will commit to supporting the reforms that would give us a democracy back. Um, So it's not that everyone would be convinced. The objective right now is to get enough convinced so that um, she could actually be in a position of doing some good. Now, let me tell you, she commits to passing these laws in the first 100 days and she doesn't, I'm not the only one who's going to be out there uh, opposing her as strongly as I possibly can because uh, I've had enough of this promise from Democrats to reform the system and do zilch about it. Look, I, I love Barack Obama. I'll just admit it. He was a friend of mine at Chicago, a colleague. And I was a strong supporter of his campaign. But very quickly into his administration, I became a very vocal critic of the fact that he was doing nothing to change the system he said we had to change. He said, quote, if we don't take up the fight, the fight to change the way Washington works, then then the problems that we face will continue to face our children. He said that again and again, and yet he did nothing to change the system. I'm tired of it from the Democrats. And so I'm with you in fighting her 100% if she wins and she doesn't do anything about it. But I'm 100% certain that uh, between the two of them, might just be a 5% chance she'll do something about it. But the Republicans have shown a 0% desire to do anything about it. And that's a reason, at least from this perspective, to be strongly um, working to get her to commit to it. Yeah? Uh, so my question actually uh, builds off of what he was saying. Um, <clears throat> So uh, let's say she were to convince people um, that she would make these reforms and that she should be president. Um, and she genuinely wants to do that. What would that change actually look like? Right. Because, I, I mean, you mentioned passing some laws, but I, I can't think of any law that would take away the huge influence of money. Yeah. Um, and on, on top of that, there are people have called Congress, which is also built on this corrupt system. And it just seems like um, maybe it's a little pessimistic, um, but I do want Yeah, and this again is the thing that I was most frustrated with Bernie Sanders for. You know, because he made this issue central. You look like, you sound like somebody who paid attention. Um, You didn't hear how it would actually fix the system. That's not because you weren't listening, it's because he wasn't telling, he wasn't explaining. 
he made it sound like all we had to do was reverse Citizens United, as if on January 20th, 2010, the day before Citizens United was decided, we had a working democracy, and somehow the Supreme Court shot it. Well, the Supreme Court shot the body of our democracy, but the democracy was all, the body was already cold, right? So it's not like the Supreme Court created this problem. Um, and what we needed was a time when America began to understand the changes that could happen. Now, here, here in fact, are three changes that Congress could pass tomorrow that would radically change the influence, the inequality inside of our political system. Number one, they could pass what I've called citizen funding just because public funding sounds so terrible, but citizen funded congressional elections, which means bottom up funding of congressional elections. So imagine everybody got a voucher, I, I think a $50 voucher, some Republicans are pushing a $200 voucher, but whatever a voucher that you use to give to candidates to fund their campaigns. So candidates would be raising money from all of us. They wouldn't be raising money from the tiniest fraction of the 1% of us. And so when they try to raise money from all of us, they would be interested. What do I need to get your money? What do I need to get your money? What do I need to get your money? And they would begin to be representative in the process of raising money. That could be passed tomorrow and the Supreme Court would never touch it because the Supreme Court has said again and again, public funding is completely constitutional. Now, it would cost money. Um, the estimates are three and a half billion dollars every election cycle, so that's 1.7 billion dollars every year. So 1.7 sounds like real money. But if you think, to the, think about the Libertarian Cato Institute, they tell us that the government spends every year has a significant amount of money for what they call corporate welfare by which they mean subsidies and tariff protections and other regulations that are benefits to corporations, Cato estimates that number is $100 billion a year. So if we could liberate Congress, so they need to suck up to corporations to get the money they need to run, and they could reduce corporate welfare by 10%, we could cover the cost of this public funding two and a half times over. So it costs money, but it's money well spent in getting a liberated Congress. That's number one. Number two, Congress could tomorrow change the way members are elected so that we would effectively have proportional representation. No longer this gerrymandered system. The Constitution gives Congress that power, and Congress has used it historically. They could just use it again. It's a simple, it's a, it's a, it's a simple conceptual change, but it would have a radical change in making the system more representative. That's number two. Number three, Congress has the power to stop the stupid ways in which states suppress the votes of the disfavored party in that state. That sometimes looks racial because the disfavored party, if it's Democrat, is heavily African American, so it looks like it's targeting African Americans, which effectively it is, but it's really targeting politics. It's like we wanna, we wanna keep out as many Democrats from voting as we can in the Republican states, and the Democratic states is the reverse. That reality is ridiculous in a democracy, and we could eliminate that tomorrow. Three changes, statutory changes, which Congress could pass that would give us a shot at a representative democracy. And the Supreme Court would not touch any of them. Now, um, I, I, that's conceptually what has to happen. Politically, what's got to happen is Congress has got to vote for it. The very system that benefits, the very people who benefit from this corrupted system have to vote for it. That's a hard thing to imagine unless we produce what Bernie was talking about, the revolution that's demanding it, but they've got it demanding it. We've got to get a public that recognizes the problem in our politics is at its core a failed institution called Congress. And somehow we have to build the political movement necessary to get people to do something about that failed institution of Congress. And that you know, is different from the sideshow we're having right now about you know, whether Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton, unfortunately. I think they could have made it the central issue, but they've not. Thank you, Vice President. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay, Lewis. So my family has gone full blown Trump, which saddens me and disturbs me. I, I, I told them he wanted to kill innocent families and stuff, and they went mad. So I've gone full on Clinton. They will never vote for Clinton. How do I convince them just not to vote for Trump? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm out of the time, I'm honest. This is really like sad me a lot. You know, I hear you because. Um, I have conservative parents, and I was so terrified, so terrified that they were going to be Trump supporters. But somehow, magically, they are not. They, you know, I don't think they're going to vote, but they're certainly not going to vote for Donald Trump. 
you know, um, I was talking to somebody who was going to fund an ad, and the ad was going to be um, images of presidents across our time, uh, history. And interspersed in that ad was going to be images of Donald Trump across our history, I mean, across the history of this campaign. And, you know, throughout the ad, you have children watching the television of these images of presidents across history. Um, you know, I, I was a Republican when I was a kid. I grew up, but I was a Republican when I was a kid. Um, I was the youngest member of the 1980 delegation that elected Ronald Reagan from Pennsylvania. So, I mean, I, I get Republican ideas. And I, a lot of Republicans I would have respected and disagreed with but think perfect uh, to elect. But I think the thing to focus on is what it does for the stature and hope of respect for this office mixed with um, the fear that I think we genuinely should have about um, the musings which he has uttered about crazy things, you know, the wall, or why do we have nuclear weapons if we don't use them? Oh my God, it's going to piss on me. <laughs> <laughs> right now? Or, or what? <laughs> you know, um, and then the final move, which is a move that should have happened at Brexit, but didn't. But after it happened, this is the way people were talking. You know, in Brexit, when, when they voted to, uh, to move out of the EU, and they looked at the vote, and they saw that all the people who voted to move out of the EU were old people, and all the people who voted to stay in the EU were young people. And it's because the young people wanted a future, and the old people had had their future, and they were finished. They were just going to be grumpy old British people when they died. Um, <laughs> What that should have happened in that exchange was that the kids should have said, hey, it's my future. It's my future. And what you should say is, OK, I get it. You have your views, but here's what I'm asking you as your son. I'm asking you, it's my future. You know, we already have um, an extraordinary burden that America bears around the world because we've lived our life as an empire on the model of the Death Star, right? This is something you can say in Ohio because Ohio has great ancestry. Robert uh, Taft, not Bob Taft's father, but Bob Taft's grandfather, Senator Robert Taft, Republican conservative, was a strong um, anti-global Republican who fought strong, fought heavily with liberal Democrats like um, uh, um, uh, you know, the whole coalition of Democrats were opposed to foreign interventionism, right? And what Taft would say is that if we build an army to fight wars around the world, the world will just come to hate us. He didn't have the image of the Death Star to draw on, but I'm going to draw on the image of the Death Star because we've waged this war like the Death Star, forgetting that the rebels always defeat the Death Star. Right? Um, and that's the part of the Trump story that scares me the most. On the one hand, he's a nice. On one hand, he's against the Iraq War, except he was for the Iraq War before he was against it. Okay, but on the other end, he talks about even more vicious interventions to stop this quote terrorism. Well, that's even more vicious hatred that will be fueled for the next 40 years against you and your children and your children's children. And, and, and that future is, I think, the best thing that parents need to be reminded of. Good luck with that. Thank you so much. Hello. Um, my question is about gerrymandering. Um, I read on Wikipedia that was one of your topics you like talking about. So. <laughs> So it must be true, yeah. <laughs> Great question. Um, and, uh, you know, at a, at a Catholic-inspired um, uh, university, I'm a little bit hesitant to 
give you this reference, but uh, there is a really fantastic new book by the editor um, of Salon. Uh, the title of the book is Rat Fucking. Sorry, that's just the title. <laughs> I, I, didn't, I didn't pick the title. Um, but it's an extraordinary account of exactly how this gerrymandering game got going. And the short version of the story is technology has now made it possible for the political party in control to draw incredibly complicated districts which maximize the chance for the minority to select the majority in a system. So Ohio and Pennsylvania is exactly the same. Their majority votes are Democrat, but the overwhelming majority of representatives in Congress are Republican. Um, and the Democrats do the same thing the other way around. In New England, there are a lot of 40% vote Republican, but not a single member of the House is Republican right? uh, because of the gerrymandering by the Democrats. Um, I think there's both a state strategy and there's a national strategy. And the state strategy is to adopt systems like in California or in Arizona or even Iowa that creates nonpartisan districting. That takes a long time. Um, the national strategy is, as I described as I was pushing in my campaign, for Congress to just draw the districts in a way that eliminates the problem of gerrymandering. They could tomorrow create, Fair Votes has created a really um, uh, compelling plan for um, multi-member districts with ranked choice voting that would create proportional representation overnight. We ought to be pushing for that. But both of these are, um, rest on a more fundamental idea that we need to articulate more clearly, which is the basic principle of equality in a representative democracy. What's outrageous about the current system is that it denies equal <coughs> votes inside of our political democracy. And it's not accidental, but that book, the title of which I will not mention again, um, so powerfully shows is it's completely intentional. It's completely constructed. These political scientists who say, well, it's about populations moving in different ways that's created this different demographic is one-tenth of the story. 90% of the story is an amazing ability to now craft districts to radically inflate the power of those who happen to be in power when the districts are drawn. And that denies this principle of equality. And what is a democracy if it does not give its citizens equal power in the democracy? And we could solve that if we focused on this ideal of, of equality. Equality is not just what we need to worry about when we worry about identity politics. That's an important dimension of equality. It's also what we need to worry about when we worry about political rights and political equality. And that equality has been completely denied in our system right now. You know, the white primary excluded 16%. That was wrong. It was unjust. It was not a democracy. The green primary excludes 99.95%. That's at least as wrong. <laughs> it's at least as bad. It is at least, it's not as insulting or demeaning because we don't even notice it. And of course, blacks recognized, the, the, you know, uh, Dr. Nixon recognized the insult in being told he couldn't vote. So I'm not saying it's equivalent like that, but it's at least as equivalent. And what it's saying is you're not an equal citizen. You are not an equal citizen in this democracy. And what right do they have to do that? And that principle of equality, I think if we began to fight uh, strongly for, we begin to guide politicians, they would be embarrassed by the games they play. Now they're not embarrassed. They're kind of proud. You know, the computer makers, the software writers are proud that they can sell software that allows you with 40% of the votes to get 70% of the congressional representation in the state. That's, that's pretty impressive in a democracy um, to be able to do that, but they can do that. Even on a Mac, it's kind of, it's kind of, Kind of cool. Um, uh, right here. Yep. Awesome. So first off, I want to say thank you for coming. This is awesome. I will not lie. We have actually changed our mind on whether to vote for oh, thank not God. a candidate, not <laughs> a candidate, but from a third party candidate to one of the ones that are actually Excellent. running a little bit. So yeah, you have seen me Excellent. put thank that you. forward. Thank you. Um, my hypothetical situation, it's not even a question, it's a hypothetical situation, is that let's say your broadcast and everything you've done here makes it to the candidate. And everybody sees how you were pushing for Clinton, not pushing like, you know, having her you know, look, having her take a stand and whatnot and have those things she needs to say and turn this all around. How do you think the other candidates will react and will they create a battle strategy for those? 
Well, um, so the other candidates, you mean Trump. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, if she tries to paint herself as the reformer, Trump will laugh. He will say, she's not a reformer. She's profited from the system. Now, any other Republican uh, would be able to credibly laugh. But I don't think he actually can get away with it because whatever corruption you're going to point to Hillary Clinton can be turned right back around against him. Like, you want to complain about the Clinton Foundation? And, and don't get me wrong. I think they were obtuse, clueless in, in an unbelievable way in allowing that foundation to develop the way it is. But it's nothing compared to the Trump Foundation. I mean, I think the Trump Foundation has been exposed to criminal violations. Has exp the information shows they've engaged in criminal behavior. And, and so from the foundation point, and you want to say Hillary Clinton's corrupt? OK. Um, has she ever paid $25,000 to an attorney general not to have the attorney general prosecute her? I haven't heard that allegation yet. Um, so you know, to the extent she makes it on the core about, I guarantee, look, I understand. I've lived in this system. I've profited from this system. This system is terrible, and I'm going to change it. Um, he can try to outdo her on that. I don't think he can. He can try to attack her on that, and then it's going to be a real fight. And that's why I said I don't think it's obvious she wins that fight. might be that 70% still believe she's corrupt. Again, I don't think that, but I think 70% could. But we're fighting on the margin now. What we're talking about is what do we need to do to make sure Ohio and Florida um, vote one way versus the other. That's all that we care about right now. And, and so that my point is I think that might be the end game strategy that gives us reformers what we've been fighting for. The idea that you know it's a last ditch effort by Hillary Clinton to become president giving us our democracy back is, look, I'll take it however I get it. I don't care how I get it. I, you know, obviously, I was willing to jump off a cliff to try to get it. Um, and uh, you know, let me tell you, the rocks were hard at the bottom when I hit. But whatever gets us this democracy back, we should be fighting for it. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, sir. The thesis of what she presented tonight was essentially that you know, Hillary needs to present herself as somebody who's going to change the system. And as he said, she's already firmly inside this box of being perceived as corrupt and benefiting from the system. But even if, well, before we even get to that point, where she would say, I support these positions that would you know, uh, reduce the influence of money in politics, what would the chances actually be that she would even take that stance, take that strategy, no. and adopt that point of view? Because, I mean, with just the example you showed of her saying, I'm great, after she passed out, it seems that she's not been taking Trump, or not, she's been playing politics as usual in this election cycle. She's not changing her strategy. Yeah. based on the opponent she's been facing. So it seems more like a pipe dream that she would decide, oh, I'm going to make corruption the issue when she's the one who's using corruption. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree with you that it seems inc incredibly unlikely. Um, and even more because I've been talking to people in the campaign. So I have a feel. I, I completely agree. Um, but the reality is she actually has in her platform a commitment to all the elements of this fundamental reform. She's committed to public funding of congressional elections. She's committed to introducing an amendment to overturn Citizens United. She's committed to talking about the way to deal with gerrymandering problems. She's committed to ending the voting suppression. She's committed to all of these things. They're just invisible because she doesn't make them central. So it's not about persuading her to adopt the positions, which you would have to do to Donald Trump. Donald Trump has never talked about how we deal with the influence of money in politics, other than by electing billionaires. And you know, we fought a revolution against that idea. It's not the solution to say, just elect the rich. That's what the aristocracy was about, right? So, so um, she's actually there in the position. What it's about is her elevating it to being the central point. And then the question is, what's the credibility of her commitment? You know, so if she said, give me a democratic Congress and I will pass it, that's a pretty easy commitment because it's going to be a hard fight to get her a democratic Congress. Um, but if she did get a Democratic Congress, why would she oppose it? 
This is the point that is so clear for Democrats, not so clear for a Republican candidate, given the differences in what they want to do. But everything she's talking about wanting to do is a thousand times harder because of the corrupt influence of money in politics. You, know, you talk about climate change legislation. We will never get climate change legislation until we change the influence of money in politics. You know, when Bernie was talking about single-payer health care, people rolled their eyes, not because it was a bad idea, but because there's no chance to get single-payer health care in a world where money dominates the influence of how politicians think about these issues. So the point is, she would want, actually affirmatively want, the system that she would be committing to bringing about. Um, and if she, in fact, um, wants it, and she could make credible that she is going to fight for it, I think there's a chance that we get at least 40% of America to believe her. At least I would be happy to go out and say it's time to believe her on this one. Sounds like you're going to uh, kick me off the stage. We're going to have to conclude, but thank you very much. Let's thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. And again, uh, please take an opportunity to uh, stop by the book signing right outside the ballroom. Thank you. Good evening. <laughs>